24 hours. That's the length of the longest motor race held today. Racing for this long is the ultimate test of car and driver. Manufacturers invest hundreds of millions into endurance racing programs just for the chance to take the top step after a day and a bit's racing. In the beginning, racing was simply a test of the machine. The first organized car competition was a reliability test organized in 1894 from Paris to Rouen. The race lasted five hours and the winner had an average speed of just 10 miles per hour. Although this race was the same length as the average American's commute in 2021, it set the stage for far more. Just one year later, a race was organized from Paris to Bordeaux and back, covering over a thousand kilometers. The winner took more than 48 hours to complete the race, but it proved it was possible. The concept of motor racing began to travel, and soon the Americans had caught on as well. But in these early days, it was dangerous, unregulated, and cars not finishing the whole race was the norm. Even as early as 1904, the Mercedes Simplex cracked 70 miles per hour, a speed which, back then, would be fatal in the event of a crash. Cars were getting too fast for the road, and so the move to circuit racing was inevitable. But the cars weren't just getting faster, they were also getting more reliable, and so they could run for much longer without breaking down. So, in the 1920s, a new type of competition began, to test the car's speed and its reliability, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Some of the greatest names in the automotive world have had success at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Porsche, Mercedes, McLaren, BMW, Audi, Toyota, and the list goes on. But for a select few teams and drivers, 24 hours simply wasn't enough. They wanted more, and so in 1931, a new breed of endurance racing was born. Not content with an enclosed race circuit, the organizers chose for the race to be held on public roads. And instead of a mere 24 hours, the new race was to take more than 84, and it was called the Marathon de la Route. The race was to begin in Liège, where the circuit de Spa-Francorchamps now lies, with the teams driving all the way to Rome before turning around and driving straight back again. The total distance was over three and a half thousand kilometers, and that distance was shared between just two drivers. There was no stopping, and without any pit lane, the drivers had to sleep in the car while their teammate was behind the wheel. It was truly the most demanding race of all time, and even making it to the finish line would be incredible. But yet, nobody seems to know anything about this race, hence why I'm making this video. Taking in all the nutrients they needed for four days of racing must have been pretty difficult for the drivers while on the Marathon de la Route. And so it's a shame that today's sponsor wasn't around in the 1930s. AG1 is a comprehensive all-in-one nutritional drink that's made with convenience in mind. It's essentially nine health products in one, and I've found it especially useful at the moment. As some of you may know, I've got my final exams coming up in less than a month, and juggling revision, school, and making videos has meant I don't always have the time to eat healthy meals. Drinking AG1 every morning before breakfast has meant I'm still getting the nutrients my body needs, and it only takes one minute to do. AG1 contains several all-natural ingredients which contribute to better brain health, and this is something I've found has improved massively since I started drinking it. I feel more alert during lessons and in revision sessions, and I feel less inclined just to go to sleep after doing work, as I've got more mental stamina to keep me going. The other day, I noticed one of Veloce's drivers posted a reel of what they eat in a day, and what's that they're making before breakfast? It's AG1, and if a racing driver believes in it, then you should too. It's easily the healthiest thing that you can do in under a minute. AG1 travel packs make it easier to stay healthy wherever you are, and if you use the link in the description, then you'll get five of them free, along with a year's supply of vitamin D3 K2 with your first purchase. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring, and remember you can't put a price tag on your own health. The first two marathons de la route had fairly small turnouts for such an impressive race, with 21 cars starting in 1931 and 20 in 1932. The finish rate was about 50%, which I'd say is pretty good all things considered. However, in 1934 there were seven teams who were all declared winners thanks to finishing without penalties. I can't figure out why this rule wasn't in place for any of the other races, but hey ho, we'll get onto this race's crazy rules in a little bit. In 1935, the result system was changed to being points-based instead of the standard whoever gets there first is the winner. As a result, there are again multiple different winners to this race, although this time it was two rather than seven. The race was cancelled in 1936, and in 1937 the scoring system changed again, this time with no explanation at all of what it means. My best guess is that it's based on a time of finish or an average time to complete a certain distance, but if you have any better ideas, then please do let me know in the comments. Despite basically no advertising at all, the race continued to grow in popularity, with grid sizes sometimes reaching triple digits. But with more people entering and more cars on the road in general, there was a growing need for a new route for the race, to limit the number of cars they encountered on the way. 
Sofia in Bulgaria was chosen, and this made the race over 5,400 kilometers long. This was nearly double the length of Liège to Roman back, and so the finish rate slumped from 50% to less than 10% in 1961, with 81 DNFs from 89 entries. Sadly, fatigue was a big reason for people not finishing, and with car safety still not really up to scratch, there were several fatalities. A lot of these involved cars which weren't competing at all, and so the organizers had to do something before their reputation was tarnished forever. And so, in 1965, the race was moved to the Nürburgring. The Nürburgring is considered by many car manufacturers to be the holy grail when it comes to testing your car. If it can handle the green hell, then it can handle anything. The circuit we hear the most about today is the Nordschleife, or North Loop. It has over 154 corners to memorize, and it's estimated to claim between 3 and 12 lives per year, making it one of the most dangerous circuits of all time. But in true Marathon de la Route style, the Nordschleife just wasn't enough for the drivers, and so they also used the Sudschleife, or South Loop. Combined, these two circuits were called the Gesamstrecke, with a length of 28 kilometers. But 28 kilometers was a long way shy of the 5,400 of the previous rallies, meaning the organizers had to settle on either a time limit or a number of laps that could be completed. 84 hours was chosen, and with no brakes in the form of slow-moving civilian traffics, this was to be the toughest race yet. One of the most notable things to happen this race was for Jackie Ix to take part, and no doubt the crazy amount of time he spent lapping the circuit contributed to his success at the track in Formula 1. Despite the Nürburgring benefiting from a pit lane, the teams were only allowed to spend one minute in them per stop. Anything longer would result in a one lap penalty, and if there was a big repair that needed doing, then there were two options. Either the team did some of the repair each lap in the pits, or the driver fixed it themselves. They carried with them in the car a toolbox so they could do just that. Refueling was done just as it would be on the normal road rallies, through a normal petrol pump. There was no special race fuel like we get in modern racing, and arguably having better quality fuel would have been more important in this race than something that only lasts a couple of hours. But these weren't the only things making life difficult for the drivers. There were a whole host of rules they had to deal with. You had to do at least the same amount of laps in the last 12 hours as you had in the first 12. But you couldn't just go slowly for the first laps, because there was a maximum time limit of half an hour per lap during the first 4 hours, and then 24 minutes a lap from then on. If you exceeded this time for any reason, you'll be disqualified. If the drivers didn't know how to fix an issue on their car, they could just drive past their pit box and into Park Ferme. There'd be a team member waiting there, but they couldn't give you tools or parts, and the only help they could give you was verbal. If you broke a fan belt during the race, then there are only two options. Either you look for one out on track that's fallen off someone else's car, or you plan for the occasion and bring a spare fan belt with you before the start of the race. Like I mentioned, you can do these repairs in Park Ferme without any help, but because this was situated after the start finish line, you'd still be subject to the 24 minute rule for lap times. Therefore, if a driver felt they weren't going to get round in time, then they'd have to just drive off with what they had on the car and get back to fixing it the next lap, when the clock was reset. It wasn't all doom and gloom though. There were a few relief windows provided for the teams where they could do repairs to the car without having to worry about any of these rules. But even so, this was a tough race. It was the ultimate test of a driver in a car and so plenty of people came to have a go. However, whether it was due to the lack of advertising or the plain fact that the race was 82 hours long, very few people showed up to watch. Ultimately, this led to the decline of the race and it went out with a bang in 1971 with the race extended to 96 hours. So why did manufacturers subject their cars to this sort of torture? Well, it turns out that entering this race was far cheaper than privately testing on the Nürburgring. And so according to Porsche, it was very useful. They were pretty successful with this testing, winning three of the seven races on the Nürburgring. I'll link to my video on why Porsche doesn't race in F1 at the end of this one if you want to see more Porsche content. A group of enthusiasts tried to revive the rally in 2011, but sadly it was cancelled. I think the closest thing we have today to this sort of challenge is the double cannonball run. This is a modification on the normal cannonball run involving racing from New York to LA and back, and the distances are about the same. But there is no race on earth that has ever come close to matching the 96 hour race on the most difficult racetrack of all time. It would never be allowed today, and even if it was, I doubt there would be many people stupid enough to do it who are still left alive. I hope you've learned something new while watching this video, because I certainly have while making it. Thanks again to AG1 for sponsoring, make sure to check them out with a link in the description. If you enjoyed, then a sub would be much appreciated, and if you do that, then I'll see you all in the next one.